Welcome to Rune Soup, a podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. Coming to you from... My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. Enjoy. Today on Rune Soup, I am very pleased to be joined by nurse and NDE researcher, Dr. Penny Satori. Dr. Satori is the author of the best-selling The Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences and the recently released What is a Near-Death Experience. Hello, South Wales. This is New South Wales calling. Hi, Gordon. Nice to be here. Well, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Satori. And we have a uh, traditional first question that we ask uh, all our guests on this show, which is, Penny, were you a weird kid? (laughs) Uh, my parents probably thought so but um, I don't know yeah I suppose I was in some respects but I think I was fairly quiet and quite normal and I used to go out and play with my friends and things like that but um, I always had an interest in things unusual from quite a young age I guess such as well where, for example, when my parents used to kind of read me stories to go to bed, I always used to ask my dad to tell me ghost stories. They used to really interest me. So, yeah, I guess things like that. Well, that's obviously very interesting, given the sort of uh, course your uh, research life has taken. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Yeah, perhaps it's, you know, underlying it all. Perhaps all those interests have been there all, all my life, really. Well, I mean, you've told the story uh, in the book and in, in a couple of other um, shows, including my friend Nick Majerison's show, about uh, the patient that kind of started you on your NDE research journey. But were there any events in, uh, you know, growing up and, and, and moving on to becoming a nurse that kind of uh, maybe pushed the door open a little bit for that in between asking your father for ghost stories and that event when you were a, a, a nurse? Yes, uh, certainly as when I was a student nurse, uh, my grandfather was diagnosed with a brain tumour and it was inoperable. And I can remember I I moved in with my grandmother to help look after him before he died. And um, I think those months leading up to his death really made me think about death as well. Whereas before I'd always kind of put it to the back of my mind. I think spending that time with my grandfather in those last few months of his life it was um something that kind of gave me made me question life and death quite a lot as well and I think then shortly afterwards I started working in intensive care and I think yeah I think that certainly did have a bearing on the way I perceived things then in the intensive care unit Right, and actually, in the in the most recent book, you you sort of describe the differences in your own emotional experience of losing one grandparent prior to your research and another grandparent subsequent to your research. Uh, would you, I mean, talk about that? What are what are the sort of what are the benefits that you've accidentally encountered in 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 the course of doing this sort of work? Well, yeah, there was a big contrast, really, because that my, my grandfather, who was um, diagnosed with that brain tumour, you know, we were I wanted him to do everything, have surgery. And I wanted him to make that recovery. You know, I wanted him to try all extreme measures to kind of prolong his life. But that wasn't going to happen. You know, that wasn't there was the diagnosis that he had. And I was very death denying that he could get over this but the fact was that he was dying and there was nothing that could be done um and the best thing that we could have done was to make his life comfortable at the end and that's what did happen but um it was funny because then I think it was 16 years later when my grandmother died and she too had a brain tumor um I had a very different kind of understanding of it. And rather than trying to persuade her to go and have surgery and and all treatment that was available, her decision was that she didn't want any surgery and she just wanted to go peacefully. And I was able to respect that and to support her on it. And again, you know, we nursed her at home as well. And we had a really uh, nice few months, you know, leading up to her death. You know, she had all her wishes and I think we met her death with acceptance whereas before with my grandfather it had been very much a death denial thing. See 
I, I mean, I, I find that lovely insofar as we can describe these very, you know, sad uh, experiences as nice. Uh, that sounds like she had a, a good death. And, and I think about it in, in a longer historical context. It's a very natural death. This is how the fortunate people get to die, as we all do, you know, b- back throughout history with with their family in their home. Yes, that's right. And, you know, if you think about the Victorian times, you know, the, the deathbed scene was a very social event and you used to have neighbours coming in and even children would be around the deathbed. And it was a very natural process. Everyone knew what to expect. Everyone knew what to do. But now we, we've kind of lost that because death is relegated really to a, a, a very small side room in a hospital ward. So, um we, we're not exposed to the dying process either because, you know, sometimes when people are dying, um, they do have visions and, you know, it's it's commonly observed. When I first started nursing, I can remember, you know, um, seeing people gesturing to people or smiling to people who I couldn't see. They were obviously having a conversation, but there was no one there. But to the patient they were talking to someone and at at first I didn't know what to make of it but I realized that this is a common phenomenon and I'm sure there'll be nurses or doctors out there who have also witnessed a similar thing and um, because death is kind of we're not exposed to those deathbed scenes anymore we're not used to seeing these things so of course the, the first thing that we think if patients are gesturing is that it's some kind of hallucination but is it, you know, because some people um, have visions of people who they didn't know were dead at the time of uh, that they were dying. So, you know, the, these things can teach us a great deal about the dying process. You're right. And I think you're absolutely right about other medical professionals uh, out there having these experiences. I come from a very medical family, uh, doctors, psychiatrists, psych nurses, theater nurses, that sort of thing. And uh, it's always the nurses who have the best story. So my my psych nurse cousin, uh, she doesn't have near death experience stories because it's, you know, a psychiatric hospital, but psi effects and and telepathy and precognition, which she finds in in patients under her care. Uh, The nurses are at the coalface and and they do get to witness the um, the uh, sort of unsanctioned um, consciousness effects that uh, happen in hospitals. Yes, absolutely. You know, that was one of the great things about my role as being a nurse, because we get to spend such a long time with the patients as well. So we're able to observe them, but we're also able to build up a relationship with the patients as well. And um, it, it exposes us to a lot of things that had I not been nursing, I would never have witnessed those things. And in fact, there's one in particular. I, I would, uh, I'd like you, Penny, to uh, to tell the story. As you said, you get a lot of experience with the patients, but the uh, the story of the patient who is is kind of patient zero for your uh, your academic research. Um, patient ten, is it? Yes. Uh, yeah. Now that that was a fascinating case because I was looking after this man, and um, he was making starting to make a recovery from critical illness. And so we decided to sit him in the chair this morning. And um, so we'd sat him in the chair and he was still ventilated. And I can remember as soon as we sat him there, he's, he kind of didn't look so comfortable. And then the alarm started uh, alarming to say that his oxygen levels are a bit low. So I connected the what we call an ambu bag to the oxygen point and I connected that to his tracheostomy and squeezed in extra oxygen and that resolved the problem. But then shortly afterwards, his blood pressure started to drop and his, far, his heart went to, into a very fast rhythm quite briefly. And then he started to get grey and clammy and all of these were signs of an ensuing cardiac arrest. So I called my colleagues and we literally flung this man back into bed, by which time he was deeply unconscious. He was not responding to deep, painful stimuli. And when we shook him or when we called his name, there was absolutely no response at all. So the doctor came along and examined him, gave him some fluid, which resolved his blood pressure problem. But then shortly afterwards, his blood pressure started to drop again. So I went out to look for another doctor and the consultant happened to be walking in for the first time that morning. So he quickly came and examined my patient and he shone a pupil torch in his eyes to check his pupils were reacting. 
we give him some more fluid for his blood pressure. And then after about 20 minutes, his, his uh, condition started to stabilise. And then the man started to kind of flicker his eyelids a bit and move his um, arms and legs, all signs of regaining neurological function. And it was about four hours later that this man fully regained consciousness as the ward round were approaching his bed area. Now, he was very excited at this point and he was trying to communicate something. So the physiotherapist got the letter board and he spelled, I died and I watched it all from above. And so the, the uh, consultant said, oh, well, you'd better tell Penny about that. And so when I interviewed him, he had described then having this out of body experience. He very accurately described the actions of the physio the actions of the doctor and correctly identified which doctor had examined him, although he hadn't seen him previously that day. And he also described the nurses, um, the actions of the nurse. Now, that was me. And he described me cleaning his mouth with um, I when he'd got back into bed, he'd actually dribbled from the side of his mouth. So I'd suctioned it up with a suction catheter and then I'd put a pink lollipop sponge into his mouth to freshen it up. But he also described seeing the physiotherapist looking very nervous, poking her head around the corner, which was the case. And he also described the actions of the consultant who correct, who shone the pupil torch in his eyes. And now I know that what he said is correct because I was actually there at the time it was happening. But those things that were going on, he was deeply unconscious at that point. So, you know, this is that, that was quite remarkable that he actually reported that with such accuracy. <clears throat> now, further to this, he also described going upwards into a pink room where he met his deceased father and um, a lady who he had never met. It was his dead mother-in-law, but he recognised her from photos. And he also saw a man and he said, now, I'm not sure who this man was. It could have been Jesus, but it's not what I expect Jesus to look like because his hair was long and scruffy and needed a good comb in. But he said when he was in this state, he was very, very comfortable and peaceful and happy he said there was absolutely no pain at all and it was just such a wonderful experience and he wanted to stay there but the Jesus type figure said no it's not your time you have to go back and as soon as he said that the image kind of faded in front of him and he floated backwards and ended back in his body but he said as soon as he was back in his body he was in extreme pain he said the pain was so bad that he wished he he was dead and Another interesting aspect of this case was when I interviewed him in depth and he misinterpreted one of my questions and he said, oh, yeah, look at this. He said, I can open out my hand. Now, this man has cerebral palsy. So he was 60 years of age at the time of his near death experience. So for 60 years of his life, his hand, his right hand had been in a permanently contracted position and as a result of his experience, he can now open out his hand fully. Now, I didn't realise the significance of this at the time, but when I later discussed this with the doctors and the physiotherapists, they both said that there, there should be no way physiologically for him to open out his hand like that because his tendons would be in a permanently contracted position. So I checked his uh, medical notes and his physio notes to see if he'd had extensive hand physio or anything like that, but nothing, there'd been nothing done to him. But he is now able to open out his hand. So that is something that really does fascinate me because if we understood the mechanism behind that, how that has happened, there are millions of people out there with similar ailments who could be helped by non-surgical interventions. So I think, you know, these things are showing us there's a lot of things happening that we don't understand. And just because we don't understand them, I don't think we should just dismiss them as being hallucinations. Something has clearly happened and we need to take these more seriously and we need to research them further. Well, absolutely, and uh, the it's this is a classic, or uh, or rather an emblematic case of of a, of a kind of wider journey since the sort of early seventies. It was observed with UFO experiences, for instance, that after their encounter, they would come back with either uh, chronic conditions that had been reversed, or uh, you know, some kind of 
uh, an extra language, extra intelligence, maybe belief that they were telepathic and some evidence that that was the case. And what is interesting to me about that and is, is the extreme overlap with people who have NDEs who come back uh, much like your patient 10, either with cures or with uh, capacities that they didn't have before. In, in your um, talk at Watkins Bookstore, you tell the story of uh, a woman who very improbably uh, ran from Sydney to Melbourne. Yes, that's right. She did. She's in the Guinness Book of Records. Um, and in fact, this lady is a good friend of my parents. And I can remember ha her having this accident when I was a really young child. I was about 10, I think I was. And um, it, she never spoke about it. She told her husband about it, but she never spoke. And it was many years later when I was doing my PhD and it happened to come up in conversation with my parents. And she said, I had one of those experiences. I can't believe this. I've had one of those. And that was the first time that she'd shared it with anyone else apart from her husband. And it's incredible. You know, every time I meet her and speak about this experience, she kind of closes her eyes and she goes back into the experience and she's there as if it's happening again. And she's, she's overcome with emotion. There's tears always streaming down her face because it is such an emotional experience for her. And she kind of, she well, she's been in the Guinness Book of Records three times and she did this ultra distance running as a result of her experience. This kind of voice is there with her and it, it always just says to her, if you go back, you will be stronger. And she said that you will be stronger really resonated with her. And um, she did, you know, her greatest achievement is that run that she did. It's the ultra distance run from Sydney to Melbourne, which is 800, and, no, 625 miles. And she ran it in eight days without any sleep. And I just think that's phenomenal. It's incredible. You know, it's one of those things that you you just don't think would ever be possible. Well, absolutely, because I think the the piece uh, I neglected to mention is that the medical opinion at the at the time of her ordeal was that she might be able to walk uh, with physiotherapy afterwards. <laughs> yeah, that's right, and she'd have to learn to walk again. You know, it's just absolutely incredible. So I think if we understood, you know, how that those experiences can motivate people and make them think in this way as well because they can achieve incredible feats after the experience well this is again this is the classic shamanic journey people who uh, historically have somehow had an other world experience so they've been very ill and died which you know happened a lot before we had um the admitted you know the miracles that are modern medicine today it's, medicine has a has a worldview error rather than a technological one and uh if you died and came back you would be the trip to the other world was in some sense the medical treatment of the time it was how you um restored chronic conditions or or, or got a piece of a soul back and the people who did that very often became you know um the shaman or the witch at the end of the village or or, or someone who um, has had that direct experience of the other world. And it's just so interesting to me that in the second half of the 20th century, uh, we're starting to see that same shape. Well, we started to see that same shape emerge in in uh, and, and disrupt a, a very materialist worldview. Yes, it is. And it's what I find really interesting, really, you know, you, we had the scientific revolution and then everything was kind of went technology way. And those ancient ways of medicine were kind of lost by the wayside. And it's funny now that we're coming around again and maybe as a result of our kind of science as well, because our technology is kind of advancing so much and so are our resuscitation techniques. So far more people now are surviving cardiac arrest than would have before. And so far more people are now reporting a near-death experience as well. And so it's almost as if that science has kind of brought us full circle and it's taken us back to those ancient roots as well. So it I, I agree. I think... Uh... Uh, I think we can actually push the metaphysical speculation out a bit further there and put some numbers around it. Because, as I'm sure you're aware, we didn't even have the word NDE until Dr. Moody's book. That's uh, and he and we only started having uh, 
you know, a dramatic increase in people returning from a clinical death with the sort of in, the inclusion of defibrillators in emergency medicine, because every the heart attack is the most common cause of death, and this is the most common way of reviving people. Now, those two things haven't ever really coincided in history, and now they have. And if you look at, say, Dr. Pim Van Lommel's numbers, based on his estimate, there are 4 million Americans and 20 million Europeans who have had this experience based on the percentage of people who have a recollection of uh, something that happened when they were clinically dead. Now, that is, if you believe in some kind of spirit world or, or external reality to where these patients go, that means we have sent we are sending more other world ambassadors, for want of a better word, than we ever have before in history. And, yeah. uh, and that's very interesting. Yes, it is absolutely incredible. And I think, you know, these experiences are far more common than what we realise. And I think people are, are willing to talk about them now as well, because there seems to be a different attitude to these experiences. Now, when I first started doing my research, let me think, it was about 1994, and I really started trying to find people to, who'd had the experience to share with me. And uh, I'd heard by word of mouth, a friend of a friend or my my aunt, my friend's uncle had had these experiences. And I said, well, could you get them to chat with me? Because I really would like to understand more. And uh, they said, oh, no, they won't talk about it. And, you know, several people I asked if they would have a chat with me and they were afraid to talk about it. They wouldn't talk. And then throughout the course of my research, I started to find more cases, came across people in the hospital. And so I started to build up my database of cases. And then it was a back in 2006, there was a, a national newspaper had printed an article about my research and they put my email address at the bottom of the article. And within 30 no within about three hours I had about 600 emails uh, about people who'd had the experience that they wanted to share with me and then in 2014 when my book the wisdom of near-death experiences came out um it went, went into a national newspaper and again within hours I had hundreds of emails and not only that people were commenting online and there were something like 1500 comments online and then it was kind of bounced around social media and by the end of that day that article had been so successful that the newspaper ran another article on the Monday and they carried on doing another three articles and one of those articles were people who had written in and were willing to have their photographs taken and to share the experience publicly and that is quite a breakthrough really because in the beginning people certainly wouldn't talk about it and they definitely wouldn't have their photograph taken either you know so I think we're seeing a lot of um, attitude change and certainly the comments that were on the online forum of the national newspaper the majority of them were very very positive so which is rare in a, in a newspaper yeah. comment section for anything <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah so you know it, sh it just shows how much there's our understanding of these experiences is changing. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned your research. Uh, we I've had a couple of, well, quite a few other people who've done research in what is currently considered unusual uh, on the show. And what I'm always interested in is what is day one like? I mean, when you're, when you're there some, somewhere in, you know, in your life going, oh, I might take research into near-death experiences further how do you i mean who supervises that stuff how do you go about going from presumably either in your house or your workplace i'm gonna i'm gonna follow this up academically what, what is what do you do next right well that was a really good question because when i knew what I wanted to do. As soon as I got interested in near-death experiences, that was it. I was hooked. I was obsessed with them. And I, wherever I went, I had a book about death or near-death experiences with me. And then I read, there was a chapter in a book, and it mentioned a course that was run at Lampeter University, and it was an MA in death and death studies. And it was run by Professor Paul Badham. And I thought, that sounds fascinating. This is what I really want to do. And so I wrote a letter in those days to Professor Paul Baden. And I just said that um, I was interested in his course and I was looking at the funding behind it and the length of the course. And I said that I worked as a nurse, so I have an interest in death. Now, 
I didn't mention that I was obsessed with near-death experiences in case he thought I was a bit weird. And about six weeks later, I, I had a reply from the letter. And it was from Professor Paul Badham, and he was explaining about the course. And then he said, um, it, would you be interested in researching near-death experiences? And I couldn't believe it. And so within seconds of reading that letter, I phoned his office and I made an appointment and I went to see him later that afternoon. And it all kind of went from there, really, because um, I had two great supervisors. Professor Paul Badham was one. And then Dr. Peter Fennick, who was a really well-known neurophysiologist, neuropsychiatrist. And um, obviously, Paul Badham knew um, Peter Fennick as well. And so we arranged it from there, really. And then it, there was a, a lot of groundwork to do because I had to go to the ethics committee and write the research proposal. And uh, so that took probably about eight months to a year to get it all organised. And then I kind of embarked on it all. I also had to get the permission of my managers at work and the consultant of the unit. But I was really lucky, you know, because everyone was very supportive of it. And um, it was just as soon as I'd made that commitment to do the research, it's as if any obstacle that, that could have been there kind of disappeared. And it was all quite easy, easy sailing for me, you know. Uh, well, we'll pick that one up uh, a little bit later on in the discussion because I, uh, I describe your methodology for for the research because I found it interesting that, uh, for instance, you changed it uh, about a year in and and the kind of uh, results that you got changed as a result. Yeah, well, what I did for the first year, I interviewed every single patient who survived their admission to the intensive care unit. Now, the reason for doing this was that I didn't want any patients to kind of slip through the net. I, and also what I wanted to find out is that if a patient is in intensive care, is the thought of being in intensive care, could that make them think that they were sicker than they actually were? And could that thought in itself precipitate a near-death experience. So I wanted to investigate that as well. Now, what I found after the first year is, because I didn't have any study leave, I had to do all of this in my spare time. So I was working full-time, so I had to go in to the unit before my shift started so I could interview patients, and I also had to stay behind at the end of my shift. And sometimes I went in on my days off as well. And at the end of the first year, I just found I was spending more time in the hospital than I was at home. And I thought I could never sustain that for another four years. So I thought, right, I need to modify this research now. And so for the next four years, I just concentrated on people who'd had a cardiac arrest. So these are people who had been clinically dead for a short period of time. So in the first year, out of 243 patients, there were only two that reported any kind of experience. Now, when I narrowed this down to just survivors of cardiac arrest, there was a big change. So out of 39 patients, there was a much smaller sample. So out of 39 patients who had survived cardiac arrest, seven of them reported a near-death experience. So that was a massive change in frequency. It went from less than 1% to nearly 18% of patients who reported the experience. So that clearly indicated that the closer one comes to death, the more likely they are to report the experience. That's interesting. Uh, well, I, I find that very interesting given that, again, Dr. Van Lommel's uh, research is, has been with um, cardiac patients as well. Now, I've got two questions for you. I'll ask the first one. Why? Uh, why are instances, and this this is speculation, this is not a conclusion of your research or anything, why do cardiac patients uh, have, uh, why are cardiac patients more likely to have a near-death experience? Well, I don't know. It, it seems that obviously their hearts have stopped. If they've had a cardiac arrest, their hearts have stopped. So there has been no, um, no heartbeat, no blood getting to the brain. So is that, you know, the only common factor I could find with my research is that the brains of the patients weren't functioning as they would do normally. So with a cardiac arrest, it's it's clearly defined there. Their hearts have stopped. There's no blood getting to the brain. And so they're, they're clinically dead. So 
with other patients who are critically ill and their hearts perhaps haven't stopped, that blood flow is still going to the brain. So maybe that's the difference. Interesting. It, could it also be then, I mean, it could be multiple factors. Could it also be given that the uh, clinical definition of death is, is actually um, written in pencil rather than pen? Could it be that when you're talking about other critically ill patients who aren't cardiac patients, that uh, their version of what is officially dead and not is kind of blurrier because, uh, you know, a stopped heart is, is, is kind of the key indicator to uh, for clinical death. So as a result, yeah. they're not really, they can't really have NDEs because we're not sure if they deed. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, but pe- people who are critically ill still can have a near-death experience without their heart stopping. It just seems to be more common in patients whose hearts have stopped. Yeah, I find that interesting. I wonder if there's a fate component to that. I, I don't know. I wonder if there's some sort of, that's why it's a speculation question. Is there yeah. something metaphysical in, is it something metaphysical to do with the heart? And there's a reason I'm asking that question as we move further on into the talk. Or is it, and this one is even kind of more speculative, although it seems less, uh, is it because people just aren't supposed to die of that uh, anymore with the kind of uh, technological skills. So it, like, it is much less likely to be their time than someone who was in there for something else. You see why it, it, I'm interested in this. Uh, you certainly won't be held to it, but uh, I'm interested in, in the speculations of it because we have uh, interesting wobbles in the data that uh, suggest there's something else going on. It could well be. And, you know, when you do research like this, it's literally just scratching the surface. So there are so many things to when we look at it afterwards, it raises so many other questions. So these are all things that, you know, should be taken on board for future research as well. No, absolutely. Uh, in many ways, it's it's almost more interesting that not everyone uh, experiences an NDE in similar or in identical clinical situations, right? So yes. um, why do you suppose the experience isn't universal? I don't know. You know, we really don't know that answer. And if we think about it, you know, the, the research to date shows that between about 11 and 23% of people who've had a cardiac arrest will have an experience. Well, what about the other 80-odd percent, you know? Do, what's happening with them? Why don't they have an experience? Now, is it because... Everyone has one, but the other 80% just don't recall it. Because I've come across a few patients, a few people who have written to me um, or emailed me about their experiences. Now, the first one was from a lady who was attacked in her home and she was kind of um, left for dead. And it was attempted a case of attempted murder. And she said that um, she recalls being battered across the head and she remembers falling to the kitchen floor and everything went black. And then after that, she just remembers waking up in hospital with these horrendous injuries. Now, during the attack, her nose had been broken. And so six months later, she went back to hospital to have surgery to correct her broken nose. And as soon as she went under anaesthetic, she re-experienced the attack and she went back to what was happening and she experienced being battered around the head again and collapsing on the floor only this time it didn't go black she then went through this tunnel towards the light and she had a full NDE so is it that people do have the experience but we don't recall it because I've had a second case quite recently of a man who at the age of 13 He'd um, had been knocked over and he'd broken his leg uh, in the car accident, but he had no recollection. All he remembers is everything being black and then waking up in the hospital with his leg in a plaster cast. But um, throughout his life, he'd felt um, something unusual. He couldn't put his finger on it. And he'd been to see uh, an osteopath and he was saying about uh, the problem he'd had in his, his back and that when he was yet long, younger, he'd had a car accident and broken his leg. And he got chatting with the, um, the osteopath and he said, you know what you're describing here? do you think you could have had a near-death experience? And the young man said, well, I, I don't know. I don't think so. And um, he, the osteopath happened to have a copy of my book. And he said, perhaps you should read this. And so this guy then read my book 
And it's as if the penny dropped and he understood things about why he was feeling like he was. He had changes in his electromagnetic field and things like that. And so this man then decided he'd have some therapy and it was like regression therapy. Now, when he told me this, I was a little bit cautious and hesitant because there's been some prior research which showed that if you have regression therapy, it can take you back to the time of when you have the experience, but it can also manifest the symptoms that were going on. So I was very shocked to hear this man had had some regression therapy and I wouldn't kind of advise people to go and have it. But uh, he said as soon as he was regressed back to the time of being 13, this time instead of everything going black when he was on the road, again, he went on and had this near-death experience where he met a man who he called the carpenter and he had this full-blown experience. And now it was over 20 years later that he was regressed and recalled it. So do people, do all people have these experiences, but we just don't recall them? You know, we, we can't answer that question as yet. Well, I was saving uh, this question for the end of it because we're, we're kind of talking about uh, research. I mean, in that sense, uh, regression and, and hypnotherapy have historically been used poorly in, in situations like this or with UFO experiences and so on. Nevertheless, if if we're looking for ways that people can potentially uh, recover memories that they'd otherwise have lost... Uh, it seems that there's a case, and this is the question, uh, if you had unlimited money, Dr. Satori, what would, uh, and also, you know, no ethics committees, not that you do anything unethical, but if you had unlimited money, what would your research project uh, look like? What are the what are the next steps that uh, would help? And, and it, it seems to me, well, it, if it were me, a subsection of that would go to having a facility with uh, credible... Uh, you know, hypnotherapy practitioners in 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 the in a correct environment for at least A B testing whether uh, the experience is more universal than the data currently show. But what else would be in this in an unlimited money research project? Yeah, well, that would be a really interesting aspect to do, and uh, yes, that would be something I would uh, perhaps look into. I'm also interested by um, the changes in people's electromagnetic field. There seems to be this kind of link between consciousness and our electromagnetic fields now I don't know what it is but that is something that potentially we could measure so we could kind of um, measure the electromagnetic field of people after their experience and see why these changes occur and is there something that we can do to initiate a kind of experience now Dr Michael Persinger has done some research with his god helmet and feels that generating an electromagnetic field around the head can kind of induce these sort of um, experiences but again there's, there's been some kind of um, criticisms of his work as well but um, you know I just think I would like to in some way research that electromagnetic effect as well. Well sure I mean criticism is is uh maybe a bit unfair given that it's it's sort of day one of this research at least publicly uh th this kind of thing went on during the cold war <laughs> as subsequently emerged in the late 70s at the church committee that uh you had kind of um spies with funny uh electromagnetic uh guns and testing and, and helmets and all that kind of weird stuff so there's, there's probably a cabinet somewhere in uh in an army base that uh maybe has some of this this original research but what i find interesting about the electromagnetic magnetic changes is this is again a corollary with uh ufo experiences uh, my favorite researcher dr jean Vallet, in this area laments the fact that there isn't enough money to follow a cohort of experiences like over a significant amount of time, like a, like over decades, to, to measure the changes in their life and whether they stick, whether that sense that is more common with NDEs of uh, a renewed sense of meaning and uh, and love for for family in the world does that persist? For, is that is that a is that a localized effect in time over ten years, or does that last for decades? Yeah, no, that's that's a really interesting point, and it would be great to do that more really with the patients uh, certainly I tried to kind of monitor the patients who were in my study as well but um, I found it really difficult to follow them up and I found a lot of patients actually died as well so I, I wasn't able to follow them up you know 
but it would be great if we could do that sort of longitudinal study where to monitor those after effects as well because from the people I've spoken to they do appear to be quite varied because some people have a very strong change in their electromagnetic field sometimes that that can last indefinitely but sometimes it only lasts a few months sometimes it only lasts a few years and then it kind of dissipates as well so um, it would be great if we could do some sort of study that would monitor that on a long-term basis. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned Lampeter. I think that's where Dr. Gregory Shushan is. I'm not sure. Are you familiar with his work? I know Gregory. He was a student when I was a uh, student. Oh, there you go. Um, I, I, like you, I mean, like your research, I, I adore um, Dr. Shushan's re- research. I think there's something hugely profound in uh in, in how we can match things like the life review, not only in other cultures, but back through time as well, if we want to talk about that for a bit. Yeah, great. Well, I think we have... Uh, well, what interests me is that despite attempts at saying otherwise, uh, we have different cultures experiencing different, say, supernatural beings or variations on a garden or or, or so on as, as, as they have near-death experiences. But underneath it, there are pieces that are common that we find across cultures and back in time that suggests, and this is quite important, and I think people miss this, that suggests that it's not a, it's not just an individualized experience, that there is deep structural similarities, which suggest not only that the experience is real, but that it is actually occurring in something that has a shared topology. And that, that is set, like, that's a kind of weird way of saying, if you match the modern medical research, the likes of which yourself is doing, with uh, Dr. Shushan's historical research, something very important emerges to me, which I think is, a, a, to, to say it dramatically, a evidence for a spirit world. Right. Well, that would kind of, when you were talking there, that kind of brought up um, the theory of Carl Jung and uh, archetypes and the collective unconscious. And that would kind of fit in very well with that. And if you think about it, you know, it, it the, certainly the conclusions I've been coming to as a result of doing my research is um, that consciousness is the basis of the universe. And it's as if we come from that consciousness and our brains, if you like, mediate the consciousness. And whereas materialist science would say that our brains produce consciousness, I don't think that is the case. I think the brain acts like a mediator and this consciousness is around us all the time. But there are times in our life like the brain acts like a kind of filter. And there are times in our life where the filter action of the brain relaxes and allows this heightened state of reality into our everyday reality. And that would make sense, you know, with people who've had the near-death experience. Their brains are not functioning as they would do normally. And I think perhaps because they're not functioning, that filter action of the brain becomes more relaxed. And hence, this altered state of consciousness or this true consciousness, which is around us all the time, but we don't perceive it, it's allowed into their everyday waking reality. So that makes most sense to me, really. Well, it does. And the the idea that the brain produces consciousness is, is a premise that, as far as I'm concerned, has been completely falsified. And it's not just when you say that... Uh, NDE experiences or NDEs are uh, their brains are functioning differently. I mean, let's be very specific. There is less brain function going on in NDEs, which is exactly what you find when people under the experience of ayahuasca or psilocybin. These these profound visionary experiences are not an elevation of brain activity. They are a reduction in it that leads to the most profound and and sort of and profoundly real experiences of these people's lives. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, it's as if there there are many ways of accessing this kind of um, altered state of consciousness. And, you know, some people uh, through the use of drugs like ayahuasca and uh, other drugs like DMT and LSD. And you can also access it through deep uh, meditation peak experiences. So there are many routes to access in this. And perhaps the near-death experience is perhaps the most profound route because it is so unexpected and 
you were literally at death's door. Yeah, I, I would say so. And uh, I, I said I'd, we'd come back to the, the heart component and why I find that odd. Now, I, I've this is another one of those metaphysical speculations that uh, perhaps uh, this audience would be interested in. But it's very interesting to me that uh, it is that the heart and, and the, the stopping of it and the recovery of it are associated since the mid 70s or late 60s with what we now know as NDEs. What Dr. Shushan's research research indicates, and I think he's correct on this, is that if you look back in previous mythologies, and, and the famous one being, say, New Kingdom Egyptian mythology, the when the when a person dies, they immediately enter the court of Osiris, uh, which is a life review, literally a life review. You have Osiris at the end. Your heart is weighed, and and there is Thoth with the, the book going over what you've done, or the scroll going over what you've done with your life, and that's the first thing that happens to people. And then, if they've been bad, they get eaten by the the crazy mixed up crocodile monster next to the scales, and if not, they move further along into the afterlife. And it's just interesting to me that the most profound sort of historical description of the life review, which is the, I believe it's the most common, commonly reported uh, NDE experience. You'll have to correct me on that if I'm not right. Uh, but but it's right there. And I find it fascinating that it, it, it centers on the heart of all things. Yeah, that's, that is fascinating. It is quite a common component. Uh, but interestingly, in the hospital research I did, um, very few people reported the life review. It, the most common element was the um, meeting deceased relatives. Oh, well, that's splendid. It's also the world's oldest religion, that that, that kind of ancestor veneration and experience of, of, of your dead clan and, and, and family is literally in the archaeological record, our, our first evidence of, of uh, some sort of spirituality. And it's perhaps not surprising that as we you know we're in the opening years of the 21st century our technology kind of tantalizingly points at the idea that there might be something quite to that mm -hmm. yes yeah but back to your point about um the heart and yeah you know that that is incredible it's it's there are so many likenesses or you know or ain't ancient compar comparisons that you can do, like with uh, Dr. Shushan's work. And it really is fascinating. And it's great that, you know, we've got this other research going on, which is supporting what modern day technology is also showing as well. Well, yeah, this um, neatly brings me back to where you said once you'd got over the, or once you'd solved the initial big step, that's step one of how do I go about doing uh, serious academic research into NDEs, then the rest of it uh, more or less kind of uh, fell into place as if by fate, except for, and this proves your point in, in a funny way, um, that first year where it wasn't aligned correctly and it had your life out of balance, where you were asking everyone uh, in intensive care rather than, and, and that disrupted the life and then you changed it and it, it, the disruption ended. But it's interesting yeah. if you combine that with, again, um, Dr. Van Lommel's work, the, his Lancet article, I think was 2001, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. Gregory Shushan. And, and there are people like yourselves that are out there doing this research at the same time that we have more of these, you know, what I previously called other world ambassadors. We have more of them than we've ever had. And there is these two things. Again, it speaks to a, which you don't have to comment on, but it, it speaks to a wider possibility that that change in culture that you've noticed as people are more likely to speak to it uh, involves us as a culture changing, but it also involves uh, an almost an other side change or, or additional support that we've kind of, it we've gone too long, maybe three generations without this stuff is, is too long and it toxifies culture. And, and we're now having a, a resurgence of, of, of that awareness of, of spirit and consciousness. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we, we're going to see more of this and there's more possibilities. There's more research being done. You know, th this kind of research, it was started perhaps in the 19, late 1970s, early 80s with um, hospital research that was done by Dr. Michael Sabom and Dr. Melvin Morse. And now it's kind of since the mid 90s we've been starting to do prospective hospital research and you know we've still got the aware project which is ongoing so i think we're going to see big changes and there's going to be more and more research done 
in hospital settings because that's the ideal place to do it really because you can check so many details and I think the more that's done the more understanding we're going to have and I think eventually further down the line we're going to see how our science and spirituality are beginning to blend more than anything. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that day. And, and I think the, I agree completely that the hospital is a place to do it. It is literally a clinical environment. So if you're looking for a, uh, a clean space to get this kind of information, uh, it's the way to do it. I also detect that there's actually less and less resistance. Uh, again, I, I, medical family, there's a less and less resistance within, uh, the sort of rank and file of medicine, uh, there are official positions that are still problematic, but every time they come out, they just sound more and more bizarre. It's like when you read a, a Guardian article that just sort of hammers on about materialism as if it's it's somehow been proven rather than a premise. These These are the comments that now feel out of place. So at the beginning of your research, you had people who didn't want to appear out of place by describing their NDEs, the, th that mood or that tide has shifted so that the people who are just unthinkingly materialists, when they say that, it feels like they're sort of weirdly out of place now. Yes, that's right, it does. And I think, you know, we, we're getting people who are more open-minded to the actual evidence that is there, and people are taking it on board now, whereas before it was very much just dismissed and didn't get any further but now now that the, this hospital research has been done you just can't dismiss it you know the evidence is there you have to look at we got a skype call drop out here uh, and i couldn't find a way to plug these two pieces back in together seamlessly so i'm just gonna segue awkwardly to the second piece oh it's all good it's all good these things happen you know spirits on the line when you talk about spirits <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It is. <laughs> well, um, interestingly, it, it, we kind of got uh, cut off uh, at uh, if they just look at the evidence when we're talking about skeptics. But my last question for you, Dr. Satori, before I let you go for real, and then the spirits <laughs> can go and bother someone else, is um, you're at a barbecue and someone raises a skeptical eyebrow to like, and so what do you do, Penny? Uh, mm -hmm. What's the case that you describe? to show that they, you know, probably don't know everything yet. What's the case with that sort of um, evidence piece for the raised eyebrow at the barbecue? Well, there's the case of patient 10, because I was there at the time it was happening. But I also met a really interesting lady in a conference in Marseille in France in 2012 or 2013. And her name is Raja Benamore. And she had this near death experience, and it's absolutely incredible. She said, you know, it kind of, she had a life review back to the time of her birth, but she also had a life review that went back to the beginning of the universe. And she felt that she'd shrunk down to the size of a quantum atom and that she'd traveled around the inside of her body. And when she came back after the experience, she had multiple changes. When I met her, she had very thick, dark glasses on because the light was affecting her. You know, a lot of people get light sensitivity. But um, she also had this knowledge of quantum physics. Now, she didn't understand it. She'd never been taught about quantum physics. She'd had the basic schooling in physics, and that was it. And her experience motivated her to go to university to study quantum physics. So she enrolled on a course and it was interesting in this conference because they'd actually interviewed her university professor. And he said that he was surprised that she had this knowledge of physics because it's not something that you could just read about or something that you could learn through doing a booster course. This is kind of deep-seated knowledge, which is acquired over many years. And he said that Raja's knowledge of quantum physics appeared to be superior to his because she'd written about things in her paper that not even he understood, but they had since been verified by publications in physics journals. So I just find that absolutely fascinating. Someone who's had no knowledge of quantum physics suddenly acquires this deep-seated knowledge of it, you know, and and that really does make me think there is so much that we don't understand. 
so much that we don't understand and uh, such a sort of um, urgent or, or valuable kind of need for further research. And, uh, and and with that, Dr. Sartori, thank you so much for your time. Where, I mean, for everyone who is listening and obviously fascinated, if they would like to know more, uh, where would they go to find out more? Um, I've got a website, www.drpennysartori.com. And um, my books are available on the internet and m- uh, all good bookshops as well. Wonderful. And uh, those uh, that information will be up in the show notes. So, um Yeah, again, Penny, thank you so very much for your time. This was fascinating. I love your work and thank you for doing your work. Great. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Done and done. Near-death experiences, psi effects, historical consciousness research and the long-term benefits of approaching death from a data-centric perspective. If you have comments or your own experiences to share, the place to do it is runesoup.com or the RuneSoup Facebook page. Subscribe to the show in iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher or on YouTube for more goodness of the Dr. Sartori variety. And find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.